And it's one of the things that we have to get right. The public square for that project mm -hmm. is across the street at a great bar called the Miracle of Science. Right. You, know, that's <laughs> right. you walk in there any night of the week. Right. You're there, everybody's in there. Right. Uh, by the way, just two uh, pieces of information. One is that library use is not surprisingly. Um, uh, and, and why is that? A lot of people go to the library now to access computers, internet, and other things. So the library itself is becoming a, a public institution that's getting redefined. And secondly, you might want to look at the work of Richard Florida, who's an urbanist and a theoretician up in uh, Toronto. He has a series of maps that allow you on his website to look at where population clusters are as they relate to different kinds of uses. And it's really clear that people want to be around other people who are doing interesting and greater things. Yeah. Hey. yeah. Uh, you know, there's somebody in the back. Where is it? Hi, so my name is David Kellum. And many years ago, Many years ago, I was in Chester, which is a town on the Welsh English border, which has part of Andrew's Wall. They have, some they have some shops there. That wall is clearly open. Shops are contemporary. Runs in Jerusalem. They have a market, Roman marketplace. Clearly reads as Roman marketplace, but contemporary. And I've seen in the Mideast a number of caravan stops that are clearly Middle Ages, but adapted for for contemporary use. Right. I will clearly feel hundreds of thousands of years ago, but I hear, but most of the conversation that you you mentioned are contemporary buildings. Right. That's kind of a shame that the older buildings that have been adapted for contemporary use weren't brought up right. and still to national. So right. I just want right. to throw right. that out. Right. Well I mean that that's a, a, a certainly a very real observation. I think though that probably the reason that they weren't brought up is that we're dealing with a whole different scale of enterprise. You know, when you hear the numbers that people are talking about, I mean, China's the easy case to talk about because the transformation is so dramatic that it's hard to imagine that there's going to be just, a, that there's a happy incrementalist approach to relocating three or 400 million people in a short time, right? In other words, that's not going to be, hey, let's add another floor on our building. That's what, where are we going to put the 50 new towers? Um, anyway, I mean, in other words, it, I think it's a question of scale, not a question of respect for the difference. Um, I really love the kind of place you're describing. It's sort of new wine and old bottles, and it never quite fits. And the fact that it never quite fits is what gives it its charm. You feel the, 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 the strangeness of the new use in the old place. I think. Most buildings undergo more than one change of use during their time, and I'm sure Fred Coder's university place will too. Um, and even those Chinese monsters, I suppose, someday will, you know, change use in some way. Buildings, buildings are like gardens. You know, you think they're finished, and that's going to be it. And in fact, they go on being replanted and revised and changed and dug out, and things happen to them all the time if, if they live any length of time. Right. Well, Robert, could, you know, I, I think it's, totally, it's a great point. Um, buildings do get reused all the time. Oftentimes, you know, good ones many times over generations. And we, you know, if you go to Italy, it's just a, it's a fun fest. You could cite hundreds per town. Um, San Miniato al Monte in Florence is, is what I remember from architecture school as being particularly great. There's three it's, it's, it's three churches in one. You know, there was a <laughs> there was one in 500, and another one in 900, and another one in 1300, and they've all gotten built on top of each other and woven together. But when we think about questions that we face today, I think this is a great point, because there's really different choices about how we design the buildings that we're designing today. Are they going to be designed in such a way that they are sufficiently, you know, the balance between being generic and being specific is really pointed. I mean, uh, you know, a, not to raise too incendiary a point, but you know, there's been over the years there's been some debate about Boston City Hall, for example. Um, and it's a great, it's a, it's it's a, it's a it's a great and interesting building. I studied with its authors, um, but that is a, it's perhaps an extreme example of a real the entire building is a poured in place specific response to something, and let, that's maybe at one end of the spectrum, and a, let's say industrial loft down in Providence or up in Lowell is another. That is, those were built for a particular purpose, but they, their dimensions, their access to light, allow them fairly effortlessly to be transformed into something else. That's an interesting subject, and, and, and maybe a perfect one for you. Because you're
Yeah, so, yeah, pretty specific. Though. Well, exactly. I, I think there's a direct relationship between this idea of authenticity and time. Because if you cite some of the examples that uh, George is talking about in Italy and other places, or even through Boston, you know, the idea that you think of the original uh, Quincy markets, what happened in 1976 before they rehabbed it or, or renovated it, in fact, the facade had taken on all these different kinds of uh, accretions and adjustments and cuts and excisions were, were made into this building. Extra stores. Extra stores. And in fact, what happened in the interest of saving history, all that history was erased and recreated. A little bit like Las Vegas, although we really can't tell. And it created a different kind of thing. So the building still survived, which is great. But it's a different kind of building. But the fact that that building had been uh, transformed by so many different people in different ways allowed us to see that time is irreversible. And that all the people and the actions that took place over time had a very specific sequence that created a history that connected us to all those different events in a different way and connected, connected us to a specific landscape. And what's happening now, we can create an environment in an instant. We can do it in Las Vegas, in Shanghai, and other places. And that's the difference between Pudong, for instance, which is the new city, and the old city of Shanghai. The old city is building these towers in the midst of all these other kinds of developments, the concessions, and so on. So there's this dynamic relation between past, present, and future. And that has a temporal depth and, 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 and kind of an authenticity that is, 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 I think, people respond to in a way that they don't to those instant environments. I would much have preferred to see Quincy Market left in the state that it was in than to have it to um, arbitrarily rehab back to what somebody thought it looked like in 1826. It was, was a big mistake. It's, it's one of the things that your, your guys' book Cityscapes of Boston, uh, 1991, <laughs> Houghton Mifflin. <laughs> uh, it is so great about it because, um, you know, another one of my favorite images is, is um, the Globe Corner Bookstore in the 60s, when it, by, by which time it had accrued just, you know, massive piles of, of advertisement, completely obscured the whole thing. Crispy pizza. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, or the sign was bigger than the building. Or most, or most baseball parks before they found uh, the current brand of authenticity in the '90s and, and and the 2000s. You know, they were cut. You know, we get all freaked out. Oh my God, they're going to put another ad at Fenway. My goodness, you used to you used to never be able to even see the the walls of the stadiums. They were covered in ads for helpful things like cigarettes and and liquor. Uh, you know, so what's what's authentic? Uh, it, it is a moment in time. It is a good point. Yeah. Um, Edwin, quick point to the question was asked in the back row. Um, another kind of change that is coming that I think we're going to have to deal with is um, ever-changing architecture when the facade of the building becomes an LED screen. And we're going to see more and more and more of that. And architecture as we've known it, something physical, something tectonic, something built, will disappear in those situations. And the building will become a kind of representation of whatever it wants to be. Um, I, I don't know how far that's going to go, but you can see examples of that in Times Square, and I think we're going to see a lot of it. Yeah. Um, like, um, oh, yeah. My name is Honey Michelle, and I have a question about how um, to focus on studies. Could you put the mic So you all have spent a lot of time talking about styles, the importance of authentic or inauthentic style. And I think we kind of forget that you know the cities are there for people to live in, and, and global cities seem to be, for us, tourists, you know, to appreciate. So if we don't like a certain style, it, it's not a great thing. Um, but sort of, I'm more interested in, in sort of the, the role of global urban design and the kind of reproduction of, of inequality. And I'm thinking of people like Mike Davies who are sort of tirelessly, you know, looking at these patterns of, of, of global design on changing cities, not for the better necessarily, uh, but the destruction of public spaces, the ghettoization of different social classes. So I'm sort of interested if you, how would you describe the global architectural trends from the point of view of people actually inhabit the areas, for one, and if you have any model global cities? Well, uh, I think that's a good question. I, I would actually argue, that I, I, I'm not sure we did use the word style. Um, I, I think maybe you might have been inferred. But uh, maybe the, the term instead is um, architectural experience. Because uh, the, the problem is, it, 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 how do you begin to talk about this? I, I, mean, if, I guess you would talk about international style yeah. and others. And maybe there is this kind of internationalism that's been, a new internationalism that's been uh, perpetuated through the new digital mediums. 
But I think if, if we think about it more as an experience, human experience, as it relates to place, it might redefine how we use material and all the other tools that we have available to create our environment. As for an example that's a, a good example of city making, I think, that's, uh, is Malmo. Uh, they, they, they've recreated the, the harbor area, and they've looked at issues of sustainability, looked at local building typologies, and, uh, uh, no, uh, in Stockholm, I'm sorry, Sweden. in Sweden, Sweden. Malmo, Sweden. Um, and they've looked at original harbor, and then re-inhabited and, and created a new kind of block structure, but also used contemporary means and, and, and methods to create this place. Well, and they built a bridge to Denmark, too, which didn't, didn't hurt any. Um, I, I, I also would, you know, perhaps if we seem to have talked about style, that's not really what any of us is primarily interested in. And you mentioned the loss of urban space, uh, the enclosed, the city of rooms and corridors that we knew from the past, and that was demolished by the automobile. Uh, it was cities reinventing themselves uh, in order to be uh, uh, easily accessed and used by the automobile that brought about the kind of urbanism that we're now, I think most of us, unhappy with and uh, looking to find some other some other accommodation for it. Well, and there are two things, I think. One, um, I think you're absolutely right at some level. I mean, there is a, there's, a, there's a kind of urban problem that has to do with these desperately poor, very fast-growing cities that, you know, I, I think that the toolkit of planning solutions uh, hasn't really responded to very well to date. And so, I mean, I, I think that uh, one of the reasons that uh, people like those on this panel talk about uh, situations that somehow they, we as societies can still get our minds around and still seem to play an active role in shaping. We're drawn to those rather than, I suppose it's like doctors who don't talk about, you know, diseases that nobody knows why they happen, have, have the slightest idea uh, how to solve them. So let's, you know, so we get drawn to talking about the things we have more clear ideas about. The other thing I would say is, this is something that influences our school here at Northeastern in, in architecture a great deal, which is, to, is that, you know, cities are composed of an awful lot of um, players. And any architecture school or design school that, in, that suggests to you that you, as an architect, have complete agency over the shape of urban environments is feeding you a, a line. I mean, it, as we all know, those of us who are voters and live in cities, there are constellations of very intense economic forces, political forces, lots of other forces, and uh, architects actually have, in this country, far less agency than they have, you know, let's say in European countries. That's why everybody likes European examples, because they're, you know, the state in France, in Spain, in Germany, employs architects and designers to have a significant role to play in shaping the future and doing some of the things we talk about wanting to do here but really lack the agency to do at the moment in my view. Stuart Brand in, in this book uh, that he just finished uh, ma makes this terrific argument in favor of the slums because they're uh, places, they're like places where people can grow, they, they can move in, they can, the housing costs nothing, they can move in, they can start little tiny businesses, they, they have access to customers. They, and, and people are constantly filtering through these places and moving into them and out of them and, 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 the, and, and up right, to, to the next best thing. And he makes this compelling case that that's what, because they're dense and because they're flexible, they work, they're places where people, they're gardens for these new societies. They, they tend to improve over time, um, at the, the quality of what, what, what architecture that may have begun with oil cans and cardboard, you know, gets gradually improved and improved and utilities come in and, and it's the newer ones that are the immediately settled ones that are in the worst shape, but they do tend to get better over time. Well, actually, on that, on that point, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, I, I hope this isn't too much of an inside baseball point about architecture schools and the discourse in our field, but I've always thought there's really two kinds of people who teach at architecture schools. There are describers, um, historians and theoreticians, and prescribers, designers. Mm -hmm. And at a lot of schools, they can live in pretty distant camps. <laughs> in other words, uh, I have a good friend, Margaret Crawford, who read, wrote a great book that I highly recommend after you've finished um, Cityscapes of Boston. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, should, you should read Everyday Urbanism, which is a great book and it describes how different uh, communities, not necessarily wealthy ones, have re-inhabited parts of uh, Los Angeles to interesting effect. 
Now, sometimes good, sometimes I'm less persuaded that it's good, but it's interesting in, in, in any case. Um, what is less clear in a book like that, however, is how to prescriptively, like if you, if you read that book and you said, okay, now what do we do? That's not clear. <laughs> What's clear is this is an interesting set of things that have happened. What's not clear is what we should do as a result of it. Then you're going to Barry. You're going to tell us when yes. you're throw something at us. Okay. Hi. Um, I, I'm uh, Marika. I'm actually a student uh, in architecture right now. <laughs> um, I had the fortune to be able to hear uh, John Courtney speak last night. Um, and uh, one thing that I was sort of impressed by in his, uh, in his talk, just about his practice, is that you know I think he was able to really have a pretty large impact. Um, you know what, you know what sort of your opinion is, is another issue. But because he um, was able to kind of innovate in the structure of his firm to be sort of an architect and one of the first sort of architects slash developers, uh, I'm, I'm sort of curious uh, if you guys have any thoughts on um, on different ways in which architects can start to have more agency and maybe ways to innovate in actual architectural practice today. To be able to... Well, certainly one way is to engage, uh, you know, for example, at our school, we focus a great deal on market-driven building types. This is not typical at American architecture schools. Um, and, and, and it's about gaining some level of agency. Um, if you are designing only the spectacular, one-of-a-kind, never-to-be-repeated building, that's good and interesting, and I, I would love to do, I like doing that, I would love to do that. It's enjoyable, it's, in many ways, it's, it's, it's very, it's great, but but it, it, you know the bulk of housing, the bulk of the bulk of office construction, the bulk of hotel building, and so forth is done within market-driven constraints in this country anyway. And so one way for architects to gain agency is to maybe take a page from the John Portman playbook um, uh, and and really understand that innovation tied to value creation uh, is a really potent. Uh, Force. If, if the only thing you're bringing to a client is uh, is buzz, and don't get me wrong, buzz can be very powerful. And there are many branded, you know, Frank Gehry. If you tell somebody Frank Gehry's doing your building, your fundraising, at least in the past 10 years, I don't know if it's still the case, would have gone up because people would say, "Wow, that's really going to be cool. It will distinguish us." One wonders at some point, after how many Frank Gehry designed institutions, does that buzz start to lose some of its potency? But I'll leave that for another day. But the point is that, is that that was adding some real value. But I think architects can, if we focus more on solving actual, deliverable, practical problems, we can get more engaged. I actually think what you're doing is incredible. Um, you may, others may not know the full extent of what you're doing, but you're very active in, in Rwanda and creating, uh, you know, addressing a real problem, working with other agencies, getting funding doing something in an environment where there's a real need. And I think that's to be commended. And I would put that all under the category of architectural entrepreneurship. And it's not just about creating architecture and forms. It's creating to a service to a larger need, showing how we can be uh, improving values uh, in society and the value of our, our environment. Um, and that can be many things other than just pure building. Thank you. John Portman's buzz ended about 1980. <laughs> and if you go to downtown Atlanta, you see one of the most horrible urban renewal areas in the history of the world. Um, and I would add to that that architects, as a subculture, are not very good developers. I mean, it's not a natural mix of uh, activities. They're much better at doing a whole lot of other things, like being good citizens and getting involved in the Planning Commission and the, and the Architectural Review Commission and the Historical Society and every other way that they can bring their genuine abilities and knowledge to bear on the situation. And I don't think we do that anywhere near enough. I think we would all agree on that. Well, I think we could have another three hours, but we don't. So what I want to do is thank our marvelous